Great friends, uh, my name is IBM and I welcome you to yet another episode of Learning Physics. I have taken long without recording a new video because I've been settling in a new school, in a new country, in a new continent, so that's why. However, I'm very grateful that we are back and again I'll be taking you to uh, solve past paper questions. I'll actually be solving past paper questions. And without wasting time, I want to start the second last chapter that I had left behind in multiple choice questions, and that is um, uh, force, density, and pressure. So today we are going to be solving a multiple choice questions from force, density, and pressure. And without wasting time, uh, this is the document. I think everyone can, uh, you'll access this document in the video description if you haven't. Uh, alternatively, you can check the old videos for multiple choice questions. This document, when you go to the video description, there's a link which takes you to which takes you to the Google Drive so that you can download this document. So let us start. Uh, I'll select a pen. Uh, now I was using Samsung Notes, but then it was disabled, so I can't use it anymore. So we shall bear with uh, Microsoft Edge. For now, as I try to find another application that I can use for my tablet. Okay, this is still too big. So a square board of side length X hangs freely from a nail P as shown. The board has uniform thickness and is made from a material of uniform density. A second square board of side 2X is made of the same material and has the same thickness as the original board. This second board is then hung from a nail Q. Nails P and Q are the same height. So the nails are the same height. What is the vertical distance between the positions of centers of gravity of the two boards? So this is very easy. I'll first of all find the set position of center of gravity of the nail, which I mean of the board, which is at nail P. So I'll draw a dotted line here. And I'll do a horizontal line. I feel this is still thick. Okay. So let's find, I, I just used Pythagoras theorem. Let this be A squared, let that be A, this will be, of course, the diagonal will be C. So I can simply say that uh, a squared, which is x squared, plus uh, b squared, which is also x squared, should give us c squared. So it means c is going to be equal to the square root of twice x squared. But of course, uh, this center here is going to be the position of the center of gravity. So it means the center of gravity for this side, center of gravity, is going to be equal to the square root of 2 of the square root of 2x squared, x goes out and remain with 2. Inside, then I'll divide this by 2 to get half, half of that length. Similarly, I'll do the same this side. Uh, I'll just find uh, the diagonal. So similarly, this side, the diagonal will be C is going to be the square root of, because this is 2, so it will be 2x, but this is squared, plus again 2x, which is also squared. And I think this gives us um, the square root of, and that is 4x squared plus 4x squared, which becomes 8x squared. So this is 8x squared. And, of course, when I try to simplify this, getting the root, uh, 8 will give us um, 4 times 2, that is uh, 2, and the 2 will remain inside. 
or if you're not good at maths, I'll write this as square root of 4x squared times 2. So I'll leave the 2 inside, the 2, 4x squared will go outside, so this becomes, when I find the square root of 4x squared, that will be 2x, then root of 2. So it means the center of gravity this side will be, I will divide that by 2, so it will be x root of root of 2. So the center of gravity is x um, root of 2. So now we can subtract, we shall subtract, we are going to subtract uh, this first one here, or maybe I can leave, let me leave the 2 here for someone to be able to see, instead of getting, dividing by 2 and cancelling, uh, this will be 2x over 2, I've not, if I don't leave, if I don't remove the 2, so let's find now the difference, because we want uh, the vertical distance between the positions, of the centers of gravity. So what is the difference? So the difference here, the difference is going to be equal to uh, 2x root of 2 divided by 2 minus x root of 2 divided by 2. And you notice that these are common, so 2x root of 2 divided by 2 minus x root of 2 divided by 2 is simply going to, we are going to remain with 1x root of 2 divided by 2. So this remains, we remain with x root of 2 divided by 2. And if you are a mathematician, you just use simple, uh, you just use simple mathematics. I will multiply this by root of 2, even the denominator by root of 2. I'm just multiplying. So when I do that, in the numerator I have a root of 2 times root of 2, that is 2, so I have 2x. Divide by in the denominator I have 2 root of 2, so the 2 cancels. And this remains, this gives me x over root of 2. So it means our answer is going to be b. There's too much, I use too much mathematics, but you could have a simpler way of doing this if you're a mathematics student. So the answer is going to be uh, b. A rigged rod XY has a negligible mass and length 75 centimeters. The rod is suspended from a fixed point P by a string attached to end X. An object of mass 11 kilograms is suspended by a string that is attached to the end to the rod at a distance of 25 centimeters from end X as shown. Which vertically, which vertically upward force acting on and y of the rod would hold the rod horizontally in equilibrium. So we want a force that will hold the rod horizontally in equilibrium when placed at at end y. So first of all, we can notice that if p is fixed, then this is causing um this is most likely causing a clockwise moment. That is causing clockwise moment if let me read it again. A rigged rod XY has negligible mass 75 and length 75 centimeters. The rod is suspended from a fixed point P. So this is causing a clockwise moment. So that means the force we are going to put at Y should cause an anti-clockwise moment to balance this. So using moments, product of force and perpendicular distance. So I will say 11 for this one times the mass, uh, I'm using the force here is going to be 11 times G. So 11 times 9.81, that is the force here, the weight here. Then times its perpendicular distance from the fixed point, which is 25, I will not change it from centimeters. I know it will cancel out. 25 centimeters should be equal to the other one. If the rod is to balance horizontally, so I will call this force uh, F. So this should be equal to the force F times its perpendicular distance, which is 75 centimeters. So you just press your calculator. Y will be equal to 11 times 9.81 times 25 divided by 75. Oh, sorry, this is F. So using my calculator, I don't know whether my calculator is visible, but it should be. So I have 11 times 
times 25 divided by 75. So that gives me 35.97. So this is 35.97 or approximately 36 newtons. So the answer is going to be C. The density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed. I think that value is known to us. And the density of glycerin is 1.3 grams per centimeter cubed. What is added, what is added to, the, to a measuring cylinder containing 40 centimeters cubed of glycerin so that the density of the mixture is 1.1 gram per centimeter cubed? Assume that the mixing process does not change the total volume, so the total volume does not change. What is the volume of water added? Okay, this is quite easy. Volume of a mixture, if you remember. So, first of all, your teacher must have told you that uh, the density of a mixture is the total mass of the mixture over the total volume of a mixture. I'll use um, small m for mixture. The density of a mixture is equal to the total mass of the mixture divided by the total volume of the mixture. That is the, ten, the density of the mixture. But they gave us the density of the mixture as 1.1 grams. So it means 1.1 gram should be equal to the total mass of the mixture, which is the mass of water, plus the mass of glycerin, I'll put mg, divided by the volume of water, plus the volume of glycerin, which I'm calling vg. I want you to also note that um, the mass of water from mass is equal to density times volume. The mass of water is going to be the density of water, which is 1 gram, 1 1.0 times the volume of water, which I'm calling VW. So that is the mass of water. And they have given us, um, okay. So that is the, 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 the that is going to be the mass of water. Then we can also find um, the mass of glycerin if we want mass of glycerin, which I'm going to call mg, is equal to the density of glycerin, which is 1.3 times um, the volume of glycerin. Water is added to a measuring cylinder containing 40 centimeters cubed of glycerin. So the volume of glycerin is 40. So I'm just going now to substitute in the equation, in this equation 1.1. So I have that 1.1 is equal to the volume mass of water, which is 1.0 times Vw, which is simply Vw, plus the mass of glycerin, which is 1.3 times 40. What is 1.3 times 40? 1.3 times 40, that is 52. Divide by... The volume of water, which we don't know, I'm calling it VW, plus the volume of glycerin is automatically 40. So we are now solving this equation mathematically to get the volume of water, VW. So uh, I always don't like uh, simplifying this, but I will do this. So I have 1.1 VW plus, well, what is 40 times 1.1, 40 times 1.1, that is 44, so plus 44 is equal to VW plus 52. Collecting like terms, 1.1 minus V minus 1, that is 0 0.1 VW is equal to 52 minus 44. So I'm just going to press the calculator to find the final answer, 52 minus 44, divide by 0 0.1. So VW is equal to 80. So VW is 80 centimeters cubed. Therefore, it means the volume of water added is 80 centimeters cubed. If you have a simpler way of doing this, there's no problem, but this is what I could do for you. A box in the shape of a cube falls from a ship into, into the sea. The box lands with its lower face level with the surface of the sea. Box. So this diagram is showing box on the surface of the sea. Okay. And then the surface of the sea is also represented here. 
here they have showed us box sinking. It is actually below the surface of the sea. The box begins to sink. The box begins to sink, becomes totally submerged, and then sinks deeper into the sea. It begins to sink. What does that mean? Initial upthrust is zero before it begin. It just begins to sink. The initial upthrust must be zero. Of course, as it sinks, the uh, remember upthrust. I want you to remember that upthrust is equal to the cross-sectional area times difference in pressure. And this is going to be the cross-sectional area times difference in pressure will be density times G times the difference in height. Before it starts sinking, the difference in height is zero. So it means the initial upthrust must be zero initially. Of course, as the box sinks, its lower face is always parallel to the surface of the sea. Which graph best represents the variation of the upthrust acting on the box with the depth of its lower face below the surface of the sea? So it's, we are looking at its lower face. So H is always the distance between the, low, the upper face and also we have H for the lower face. Now when the box has not yet started it, uh, sinking, it means the difference in height between the upper and the lower is going to actually be zero in this case. So it means that is with respect to the surface of the water. That means uh, the upthrust on the object when it, before it starts sinking must be zero, which means we eliminate B, which B is saying initial upthrust is not zero and it is showing that the upthrust is constant. As the box gains begins sinking, it means the difference the difference in pressure at the bottom and the top changes. At the top, it is only going to be, if it is, it has not yet started, it has not fully submerged. At the top, it is atmospheric pressure. And at the bottom is the pressure due to that part which is submerged in the water, plus the atmospheric pressure. So it means the pressure at the bottom is greater. So the upthrust starts increasing as the box starts getting submerged. So this one is, is showing that the upthrust increases indefinitely. But as upthrust increases, a point reaches where delta H remains the same because the box is fully submerged. That means at this point where H stops changing because the H, delta, the maximum value of change in H is equal to the height of the box. That is the maximum value of change in H. So if it has been fully submerged, then the change in H will no longer be changed. Uh, I mean, change in H will be constant, so it means the upthrust at that point remains constant. So it means A is wrong, which shows that the upthrust is increasing forever. Then, we have now to choose between C and D. C, uh, of course, the answer is going to be C, because... I'm saying when the, when the box is fully submerged, delta H is going to be the same throughout. That means the upthrust remains constant. But then we notice that upthrust is directly proportional to change in H, which makes this to be a straight line. That means this one is not going to be correct because this is a curve. Upthrust, because A is constant, density is constant, G is constant, upthrust is directly proportional to the difference in height, which makes this to be a straight line. So it means it should be a straight line until delta H stops changing, so it becomes a horizontal line. So the answer is going to be C. What is not necessary requirement of the forces in a couple? Remember, a couple refers to two forces that are equal but opposite. Their lines of action will never meet. So what is not necessary, a necessary requirement? Number one, they act in opposite directions. That is true. They act along different lines. That's true. Their lines of action will never meet. They have the same magnitude. They are equal but opposite. They produce a resultant force. Of course, they don't reproduce a resultant force. If force is a vector quantity, one force is acting that direction, another one. Remember, they are both having the same magnitude. Then they don't produce a resultant force. However, a couple can re produce a resultant moment. They can cause a turning effect. So our answer is automatically going to be D because they said what is not. A box of length 12 centimeters and weight 0.43 newtons is placed on a horizontal 
table with the greatest part of its length overhanging the edge of the table. The edge of the table acts as a pivot. The center of gravity of the box is at its geometric center. To balance the box, a uniform sphere of diameter 2.4 cm is placed inside the box, touching one end as shown in the diagram. So we can see the diagram here. Assume that the forces acting on the box are in the plane of the diagram. The forces acting on the box are in the plane of the diagram. Which forces are these ones? First of all, the box has a mass, so we expect that at its center there is a weight which acts vertically downwards. I don't know that this is the center. So there's a weight acting vertically downwards. And they gave us uh, the weight, I think. The weight of the box is 0 0.43. So this is 0 0.43. The sphere also has a mass. Uh, the sphere has a mass. Okay, we can assume because we want to find the minimum mass of the sphere. The sphere has a mass and its weight acts at the center of the sphere. So I'll put a weight W here for the sphere acting vertically downwards also. Okay. So assuming that the forces acting on the boxes are in the plane of the diagram, what is the minimum mass of the sphere that is needed? to maintain the system in equilibrium. What is the minimum mass of the sphere required to maintain the system in equilibrium? So first of all, the diameter of the sphere is 2.4. Let's first find uh, this distance here. So the weight um, of the sphere W times, because we want the sphere to maintain the box in equilibrium, so we shall multiply this by the minimum. Uh, okay, let me just choose a point of, uh, I just want to take this as a point. And this distance is going to be uh, 2.4 centimeters divided by divide by 2, that is 1.2. So this will be times 1.2. This should be equal to 0 0.43 times. Uh, I want the perpendicular distance from the center of 0 0.43 to the point where I'm taking moments. So this is going to be, I first divide this by 2, so that is... Here yeah, it is uh, 6. Is it 6? This is 6. So from 6, if I'm taking moments about this point, I will set then 6 minus uh, 2.4. 2.4 because this distance is also 6. So if I subtract this distance here, which is 2.4, it means I have W times 1.2 is equal to 0 0.43 times um, 6 minus 2.4. I think that is 3.6. So when I press my calculator, I just want to divide 0 0.43 times 3.6 divide by 1.2. So this is giving me uh, 1.29 as the weight of the sphere. So the weight of the sphere is equal to 1.29. Okay, so the weight of the sphere is 1.29. Note that I have decided to take moments about this point here. I've, I've decided to take moments about this point here so that this one causes a clockwise moment and this one causes an anticlockwise moment about this point here. So if the weight is that, then if I want to find the mass, mass is weight divided by G. So it will be 1.29 divided by 9.81. So if I check with my calculator, divide by 9.81. So this gives me 0 0.13. So the mass is 0 0.13 kilograms. You notice that I didn't change the units for this distance. I divided 2.4 by 2 to get 1.2. 
because the diameter of the sphere is 2.4, so the radius is 1.2. And I'm taking moments about this point, so I need the perpendicular distance from the center of the sphere to this point where I'm taking moments, which is 1.2 centimeters. I also needed the perpendicular distance from the center of the weight, from the center of the box, to this point where I'm taking moments. That's why I said 6 minus 2.4. And that gives me 3.6. So the weight, the mass of the sphere should be approximately uh, 0 0.13. So our answer is going to be B. I think that is quite technical. An object is suspended by two ropes. One rope has tension for 10 newtons at an angle of 60 degrees to the horizontal. The other rope has a tension of to 10 newtons at an angle of 10 degrees to the horizontal. The object is in equilibrium. What is the mass of the object? The object is in equilibrium. What is the mass of the object? Of course, in an exam, you can use any method. You can use scale, but since this is just um, a simple question, you can use uh, resolving. So, I am going to resolve uh, to the vertical first. I'm going to resolve the vertical and I equate to the weight. Let me just see which other force is acting here. The object, the rope, the tensions are 410 in one and 210 in the other. And we want what is the mass of the object. So it has a weight. Let's say the weight is acting downwards. Let me just call this one um, M times G. That is its weight. So if I resolve these weight, these tensions upwards and there is equilibrium, the tensions should give me um, mg. For example, the ten this tension of 410, resolving it upwards to be 410 sine of 60. This one resolving it upwards to also point upwards and to be 210 sine of, of 10. When I sum these two because they are acting in opposite dire in the same direction, they, will, they should give me mg. Therefore, 410 sine of 60 plus 210 sine of 10 should give me the mass times g which is 9.81 so i can now press my calculator to get m i'll just press the calculator to get m so we have 410 sine of 60 plus 210 sine of 10. So that is the total on the left-hand side. Then I divide this by 9.81. So I'm getting M as 39.9. .9. So M equals 39.9 .9 kilograms. So what does this imply? So it means M is approximately going to be 40 kilograms. A solid cube is floating in equilibrium in a liquid in a liquid mercury. The cube is made of iron of density 7,900 kilograms. The cube floats with 42% of its volume above the surface of, of, of the mercury. 42% of its volume is floating above the surface of mercury. What is the density of mercury? I want you to note and recall from what you have studied in the past that an object displaces um, its own volume. An object displaces its own volume. And if that is true, then we shall notice that um, the volume, the volume, uh, displaced is going to be equal to because they say the cube floats with 42 percent of its volume above the surface of the mercury so it means if 42 is above the one which is submerged is going to be 58 so 58 percent is the same as 0 0.58 so 0 0.58 of its volume v is fully submerged so it means the mass is equal to density times the volume, which is submerged. And if mass is equal to density times volume, then this is going to be the density is given as 7,900 then times V. 
So uh, it also means that the density is going to be equal to, because what is the density of the Mercury? So the density of the Mercury is going to be equal to, um, here I was finding the mass which is submerged, the mass which is fully submerged. So the density of the liquid of the Mercury is going to be equal to the mass which is submerged, that is 7900V, divided by the mass of, um, I mean the volume of, the volume which is, the volume which is submerged, that is 0 0.58V. So this is going to give me uh, 7900 divided by 0 0.58, which is 13,620, 13,620, approximately 14,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So the answer is C. Of course, this is quite uh, not, it's not direct, I know. They say the cube floats with 48% of its volume above the surface. So which volume is submerged? This is the volume submerged in the mercury. And remember I said an object displaces its own volume. So if this is the volume that is submerged. So this is the volume of mercury that has been displaced. So that is the volume of mercury that has been displaced. And if I want to find the mass that has been displaced, then the mass is the density of the object times um, times its volume. And I said if the volume of the object is V, then it means the mass would be the density times the volume. And the density of the cube was 7,900 and its volume, let's say it's V. So if I want to find the density of a microlay, I'll find the mass of the object, which is 7,900 V, divided by the volume which it displaces, which is 0 0.58 V. And that's how I got 14,000. The answer is C. The diagram shows two vessels, P and Q, both with sides inclined at 45 degrees to the horizontal. Okay. Vessel P, ta vessel P tapers outside, outwards, and vessel Q tapers inwards, as shown. Both vessels contain a liquid. The depth of the liquid in the vessels is the same. So depth is the same. The liquid in a vessel P is twice as dense as the liquid in a vessel Q. That is very important. The liquid in vessel P is twice as dense as the liquid in a vessel Q. And I say that is very important. What is the ratio pressure due to the liquid on the base of P over pressure due to the liquid on the base of Q? So we know that pressure due to liquids is equal to H density times G. So let's simply find the ratio. We want pressure due to the liquid on the base of P. So that will be H. The density of P is twice that of Q. So let me say this is twice rho times, times G. Divide by for Q, the depth remember was the same H. And we said if the density of P of P of Q is zero, the density of P was twice zero. So this will be simply times zero, then times G. And you notice that this gives you two over one because the other quantities cancel out. So it means our answer is going to be simply A. That is two divided by one. That is the ratio we are talking about here. Which diagram shows a couple formed by two forces, each of magnitude F? acting on the road. So first of all, the two forces must be acting in opposite directions. These ones are not in opposite directions. These ones are in the same direction. These ones are not in opposite directions. So the answer is automatically D. They should be equal and in opposite directions. Their lines of action never meet. These ones, in the C, the lines of action could meet. In the A, they are acting in the same direction. In F, there's a possibility of the lines of action meeting if we prolong them. So it means F does not really work here. So it means our answer is automatically going to be D. A student states that if an object is in equilibrium, the sum of the clockwise moments about a point X is equal to the sum of the anti-clockwise moments about a point Y. This is not true. 
the sum of clockwise moments about point X is equal, should be equal to the sum of anti-clockwise moments about the same point. It should be about the same point. So which condition would make the student's statement correct? A, either X or Y is the center of gravity of the object. Either X or Y is the center of gravity. I don't think that makes sense. Either X or Y is the pivot of the object. I don't think that's true. X and Y are at the opposite ends of the object. Opposite ends. I don't think that is true. X and Y are the same point. So this is going to make sense because it should be at the same point. So the answer is going to be automatically D. The sum of clockwise moments about a given point is equal to the sum of anti-clockwise moments about the same point. So X and Y are the same point on the object. A uniform rod of length 30 centimeters and weight 5.2 newton is attached to a wall and a wall by a hinge at one end. The other end of the rod is supported by a wire so that the rod is horizontal and in equilibrium. The wire is at an angle of 40 degrees to the horizontal. What is the tension in the wire? So here we're just looking for the forces. The, the rod is uniform, its weight acts at its center. So at the midpoint of this road, I have the weight, which is given as 5.2 newtons. Then this wire has a tension, tension T in it, and I will resolve the tension vertically upwards. Using 40 degrees, um, using the angle 40 degrees, if I resolve the tension to the vertical, this will automatically be T sine of 40. Resolving the tension vertically upwards, that is T sine 40, if you use this angle here, which is, I think, 50, you can also have T cos of 50. It gives you the same thing. I will just use T sine. I will continue using T sine 40. So what is the tension? For equilibrium, the, uh, the tension, I will take moments about uh, maybe this hing. I will take moments about the hing. So T sine 40 is causing uh, an anticlockwise moment. So I said T sine of 40 times its perpendicular distance from the pivot, which is 30 centimeters, should be equal to 5.2. And the perpendicular distance is this distance here, which is a half of 30. That is 15 centimeters. So this would be times 15 centimeters. And of course, centimeters cancel out. That's why I need to convert the units. So I have 5.2 times 15 divided by um, 30 divided by sine of 40. So I am getting uh, the tension as 4.0. So T is equal to 4.0 Newtons. So the answer here is going to be B. A horizontal bar, a horizontal bar, uh, a horizontal metal bar PQ of length 50 centimeters is hinged at end P. The diagram shows the metal bar viewed from above. So the diagram is showing the metal bar when viewed from above. Two forces of 16 newtons, 5 newtons are in the horizontal plane and act at one end at and act on NQ as shown. What is the resultant moment about P due to the two forces? We want the resultant moment. Okay. Resultant moment, we are taking moments about P, so that is very easy. Uh, this is acting perpendicular, so the perpendicular distance is 50. So we also need the perpendicular distance of this one. So the easiest way to find the perpendicular distance of this one it is easier to resolve it, to make it uh, perpendicular. So I will just find the perpendicular component rather than using 16 newtons. I'll find its perpendicular component to the rod. So resolving it perpendicular, it will be 16 uh, sine of 30. So in other words, the perpendicular distance could be 50 sine 30 if you are a good mathematician. But so this will be causing um, 
that will be causing an anti-clockwise moment about P and this is causing a clockwise moment about P. So we want the resultant moment. So I will just subtract. So the resultant moment is going to be a 16 sine of 30 times of course here I must change because I'm going to subtract I must change the units of distance so 50 centimeters 0 0.5 so this is times 0 0.5 why am I multiplying by 0 0.5 when I resolve this to the vertical it makes 90 degrees so the perpendicular distance of 16 sine 30 from P is still 50 so that is times 0 0.5 minus added 5 newtons times again 0 0.5 so I'll check this with my calculator, 16, 16 sine of 30 times 0 0.5 minus, of course 5 times 0 0.5 is 2.5, so I'll just say minus 2.5, which is 1.5, so the difference is 1.5, so this is equal to 1.5 newtons. So I said, remember I said minus 5 times 10 times 0 0.5, which is 1.5 Newton. Actually, it is Newton meters because this is Newtons and this is in meters. Newtons, meters. So it is Newton meters. Newtons, meters. So the difference is 1.5 Newton meters. So the answer is going to be A. A cube W, X, Y, X, Z, Y has sides of length. 2.0 centimeters in mass 24.0 grams. The cube rests on a meter roller, a meter roll of negligible mass. The geometrical center of the cube is vertically above 70 centimeter mark on the scale of the roll. Okay. The cube has a non uniform density so that its center of gravity is not at its geometrical center. The center of gravity of the cube is in the plane of the diagram. The roll rests on a pivot. The roll rests on a pivot at the 50 centimeter mark, a mass of 23.4 grams placed vertically above the 30 centimeter mark. The roll is horizontal and in equilibrium. What can be determined about the position of the center of gravity of the cube? Number one, it must be somewhere along a horizontal line that is 0 0.5 centimeters from line WX. He says it must be somewhere along a horizontal line that is 0 0.5 centimeters from the line XY. So it's saying along a horizontal line, which is around 0 0.5 centimeters along line WX. Let's see the second one. It must be somewhere along a horizontal line that is 0 0.5 centimeters from line YZ. That is 0 0.5 centimeters from line YZ. So it can't be along this. It can't be along... WX it can be along YZ, of course, even though it is not uniform, so these two do not make any sense. It must be somewhere along the vertical line that is 0 0.5 centimeters from line y, WY. So it's saying it, is, it must be somewhere along a vertical line, which is 5, 0 0.5 centimeters. Let me see. This distance 60, 69 and 71 is the difference is 2. Uh, I think the units given here are centimeters. So that is 2 centimeters, which is 0. Point. Okay, that is 2 centimeters. So it is saying it must be somewhere along a vertical line. Yes, it is along a vertical line. That is 0 0.5 centimeters from line WY. So 0 0.5 centimeters means along somewhere along here. Because this is 2 centimeters, I have to divide this into 4 parts. 
one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters. No, zero point one centimeter is here. So it is saying zero point five along somewhere here from the line WY, which leaves a lot of weight to the other side. So I don't think this makes sense. It must be somewhere along a vertical line that is 0 0.5 centimeters from line X, Z. 0 0.5 centimeters from line X, Z. Remember they said a cube, W, X, Y, Z has sides of length 2 centimeters. So it is 2 by 2. The cube rests on a meter rule with negligible mass. The geometrical center of the cube is vertical above 7 centimeters mark on the scale of the rule. It is vertically above 7 centimeter, 70 centimeter mark. The geometrical center, it is at the 70 centimeter mark. That is the geometrical center. So this is 70. And if the geometrical center is at the 70, they say the cube has a non-uniform density so that its center of gravity is not at its geometrical center. So its center of gravity is not at its geometrical center. The center of gravity of the cube is in the plane of the diagram. So it can't be along yz, it can't be along um, yx, it is within the plane of the diagram. The rule rests on the pivot at the 50 centimeter mark. A mass of 23.4 grams is placed vertically above the 30 centimeter mark. The rule is horizontal and is in equilibrium. If the rule is horizontal and is in equilibrium, let's try to find... Okay, remember its center of gravity is not at 7. So if this distance here, this distance here is going to be 50 minus 30, which is 20. So this moment, the moment this side is going to be, I'll just multiply with the calculator, 23.4 times 20. The moment this side without converting the units is 468. And if we take it to be at 0 0.5 from WY, it means um, the cent if the center of gravity is 0 0.5 from WY, what would be the moment this side? The moment this side is going to be, remember this distance is 50, so 0 0.5 means this is 69.5. So we have 69.5 minus 50, then times um, 24. So that is 468. So it means the answer is C, not D. It should be that 0 0.5 from, it is going to be 0 0.5 from, from the line Y, from the line WY. So it is 0 0.5 from the line WY. Because if this distance here is uh, 69.5, I've added the 0 0.5 minus 50. Then I multiply this by the, the, the mass, which is 24. I get the same value, I get two, I get four six eight as before. So it means it must be zero point five from the vertical line WY. So the answer is going to be C. I don't know whether this is clear to some people. Maybe I need to repeat it for others. So precisely the moment this side is six four four six eight without changing the units. So the moment this side should also be six four eight. So if the weight is if the weight the mass is twenty four, so the moment here is going to be twenty four times the perpendicular distance. Let me call it x. So four six eight should be equal to twenty four times x. So I'll just divide four six eight by twenty four which gives me 19. So this gives me 19, um, x as 19.5 centimeters. So if this is the 50 centimeter mark and x should be 19.5, where should we stop? So 
If I add here 50, so I will say plus 50, plus 50, that is at 69.5. So 69.5, it is somewhere there. That is 0 0.5 from, from the line uh, WY, 69.5. So I said 19.5 plus 50, which is 69.5 centimeters. So that means it is 0 0.5 from the vertical line uh, WY. So the answer is C. A rigid sphere is held to at rest on a seabed. When the sphere is released, it rises to the surface of the sea. The seawater has uniform density. Which statement about the sphere from its series release until it reaches the surface is correct? Number one, the sphere always moves with a constant acceleration. I don't think that is true. Remember, the up thrust is equal to the cross-sectional area times difference in pressure. And this means this would be the cross-sectional area. Difference in pressure would be density times G times the difference in height. So before it is released, uh, there is already, because it is, it is held at rest on the seabed, that is at the bottom of the sea. When the surface is, re when the sphere is released, it raises to the surface. Of course, if it raises to the surface, when it reaches the surface, it means the thrust goes to zero because the difference in height uh, in the liquid is going to be different. So it means this one which says it move, the sphere always moves with a constant acceleration. The acceleration is not even constant because as it moves, the drag force also increases. The sphere always moves with a constant velocity. Of course, if it is moving upwards, then the velocity must be also changing. It is not uh, constant. The up thrust on the sphere always decreases. The up thrust of the sphere always decreases. I think that is not true. So before it reaches the surface, I think the up thrust remains constant because the difference between the height of the object, this is the sphere, it is a sphere. As long as it is within it is submerged, the pressure on the top and at the bottom, the difference in the pressure at the top and the bottom remains constant. This takes us, this takes into consideration of this part here. Because up thrust depends on the difference in the pressure on the top and the bottom, which depends on the height at the top and the bottom. If it is still submerged, the difference in the pressure remains constant throughout, which means the up thrust on the sphere is always constant as long as it is within, within the liquid. So if the density is uniform, G is constant, cross-sectional area is constant for the same sphere, it means the up thrust on the sphere is always going to be constant as long as it is within the liquid. So what is the unit of density? I think this is obvious. Density. Of course, this can't make any sense. Per meter, per meter, per millimeter, that can't make sense. The Newton part makes this one not to make any sense. Um, the squared here makes this one not to make sense. But the millimeter is cubed. This is mass, this is volume, so that one makes sense. Two cables, are, because density is mass times volume. Two cables are attached to a bracket and exert forces on, uh, as shown. What are the magnitudes of the horizontal and vertical components of the resultant of the two forces? Of course, this is a repetition, it is repeated here. Okay. We want the magnitudes of the horizontal and vertical components. To begin with the vertical, this one points vertically downwards, and when we resolve 6 to the vertical, it will be 6 cos of 40. And this one will point vertically upwards. When you resolve 15 to the vertical, it will be 15 sin of 20 because the angle is with the horizontal. That means resolving to the horizontal is cos to the vertical it is going to be sine. So we need to find that difference. We need to find that difference. So this is going to be 15. I don't know which one is bigger, but maybe 15 sine of 20 minus 6 cos of 40. So I subtract this because 
then in opposite direction. Then in the horizontal, uh, six newtons to the horizontal point in this direction, and to be six sine of 40. 15 newtons in the horizontal will point in the same direction and to be 15 cos of 20. So the resultant here will be 15 cos 20 plus 6 sine 40. So let's find these resultants here. Remember this was vertical and this is horizontal. So for vertical, to begin with the vertical, we have 15 sine of 20 minus 6 cos of 40. So that is 0 0.534. 0 0.534. Then horizontal, we have 15 cos of 20 plus 6 sine of 40 so this is 17.95 which is approximately 18 newtons sorry so this is approximately uh, 18 newtons so the answers we have 18 and 0 0.53 so the answer is going to be c A horizontal wooden plank is pivoted at one end as shown in the diagram. It is pivoted at this end here. The plank has a mass of uh, 100 kilograms and a length of 10 meters. The center of gravity of the plank is a distance of 4 meters, so the mass is here. So the force here is 100 times g, which g is acceleration due to gravity. What is the moment of the weight of the plank above the pivot? So we want the moment. Moment is force times the perpendicular distance. So the moment is going to be the weight, which is 100 times 9.81 times the perpendicular distance, which is 4. So you have 100 times 9.81 times 4. So this gives us 3, 9, 2, 4. Newton meters. So this is approximately, I think this is approximately 4 times 10 power 3, which makes the answer to be C. When must, uh, when must an object be in equilibrium? I want this to be the last question in this video. I want these videos not to exceed one hour. When must an object be in equilibrium? So for an object to be in equilibrium, two conditions must be satisfied. Number one, there should be no resultant force acting on the object. No resultant force acting on the object. And two, there should be no resultant moment or no resultant torque. Those two conditions must be uh, satisfied. So A says when no resultant force acts on the object. There may be no resultant force, but when these two forces are constituting what we call a couple, a couple could cause a rotation when no resultant force and no resultant torque acts on the object. So the answer is going to be B. Because when there's no resultant force acting on the object, we, we have what we call translational equilibrium. And when there is no resultant torque acting on the object, then we have what we call rotation equilibrium. So the object cannot move from one point to another point because there is no resultant force. But the object can also not rotate because there is no resultant torque. So we say that the object is now in equilibrium. Okay, so let this be the end of part one. This is the end of part one of force, density, and pressure. Multiple choice questions. See you in part two. Hello.